Hello, and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy, folks. And our special guest, co-host of the KingCast, Scott Wampler. Hello, everyone. Uh, Scott, we're so glad that you could join us uh, for this episode. Mm-hmm. Um King Ca- also congratulations on all the success of the King Cast. Like landed on some <laughs> some year end like best podcast lists, and yeah, it's just a uh, great show for, for for anyone who's a Stephen King fan. We're delighted by it. Um, it we was it was like a historical show about kings. <laughs> <laughs> talk about a new king. Each you episode. wouldn't believe how much bullshit we went through just trying to land on a name, and that was like the first thing <laughs> Vespi came up with, and then we went through like fifty different titles and it just kept coming back to that's the simplest the cleanest thing you know once it starts getting too cutesy like a kings on king King or yeah or some bullshit like that yeah it was just you know now it's starting to sound like a game show or something so (laughs) um but launching that podcast uh in the middle of everything else going on last year um and it's still going on uh was it's it felt like a real uphill battle because you know everyone and their uncle was launching a podcast you know we were coming into a very crowded field and um we're just beyond thrilled and uh proud that it's caught on the way that it has um yeah so definitely subscribe to the king cast if you don't already mm-hmm. but uh today we're actually we we brought on Scott to talk about uh the work of composers Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross last month we got new basically new scores from them they did a score for mank mm-hmm. and they did a score for soul and so scott is a is is a diehard nine inch nails fan indeed um, and so before we get into sort of talking about Reznor and ross and, and the work that they've done basically since i mean i looked at their i was going through their filmographies and and the social network was their first movie score mm-hmm. and you know they walked out with an oscar for it so yes. they're pretty good but you know, before we get to, to that stuff, I want kind of wanted for, for people who maybe aren't familiar with Nine Inch Nails, uh, Scott, if you could kind of walk people through like why Nine Inch Nails is such an influential um, artist group, you know, what, why, why they matter. Well, when they came along and I mean, they came along earlier than the mid 90s, but it was really uh, the downward spiral that sort of tipped them over into superstardom, you know. And at that time, you know, that was sort of toward the middle to tail end of like the grunge era. Um, There was nothing else on radio that sounded quite like that at that time. You know, we were still dealing with Alice in Chains and Pearl Jam and Nirvana. Um, I remember the first the first time I heard a Nine Inch Nails song uh, was a buddy of mine came over to my house and was like, you got to hear this. And he pulls out a CD. It was like some shit in a movie, you know, Uh, and he put on the single for March of the Pigs. And I distinctly remember I couldn't have been, but maybe 14 years old, 13, something like that. And I remember having the thought, this is the loudest fucking thing I've ever heard. (laughs) And I loved it. You know, it sounded like it sounded unlike anything I had heard before. And I think that was the case for a lot of people of that generation. You know, you can go backwards now and find who their influences were. Certainly, you know, they didn't come completely out of nowhere. But for a lot of people, they were tapping into something that they had never encountered before. Um, and every album they've made has been different. Uh, you know, there's always that Nine Inch Nails flavor to it, but they have evolved as artists over and over and over and over again. And there's no one producing music, you know, uh, I, I'm sure that's an arguable statement, but very few people are producing music that's as layered or intricate or, you know, just um, words are failing me. Um, what they do is is singular right now. And I think part of their staying power has to do with that evolution they've made as artists, but it also has to do with the fact that Trent Reznor, as sort of the de facto face of Nine Inch Nails for all these years, is um, he's into tech shit and he's always been at the the bleeding edge of whatever's going on in in tech. You know, they released the slip directly. No record company involved. They put that shit online. I think Radiohead Radiohead did it around the same time. They're another group that 
uh, has been similarly um, uh, what's the word ahead of the curve, I guess, in in terms of technology and embracing it. And um, I think staying on that on that edge and always pushing to do new things technologically and as artists has has kept them relevant and, and viable for all these years. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned Radiohead because, you know, for me, I mean, I definitely think I agree with you, like Nine Inch Nails is sort of at the bleeding edge of the technology. Mm -hmm. But one of the advantages I see of Nine Inch Nails is like, I feel like Nine Inch Nails has never been consumed by that technology. Like when I listen to like Radiohead's no. King of Limbs, it's mm -hmm. like, you okay, you need to brack off the Pro Tools a bit. You need to just scale <laughs> it back yeah. just a yeah. bit. But like Nine Inch Nails is like, it's, I don't know. I don't ever feel like there's a drop off. And I, again, like when you go back, if you're like saying like they really caught on in 92, that's like almost 30 years. Like it's crazy for any group yeah. to have that kind of staying power and not just be relegated to like, they're an oldie. Like that's what grandpa listens to. Mm -hmm. And, and also now helps. U2's album is free on all your iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it helps that they're also, they've also been blessed with impeccable, um, aesthetics and art design and they're very uh dedicated to making each album sort of an experience when you open it you know um i stopped buying cds years ago but uh i buy all you know everything resonant ross and nine inch nails are releasing i i'll pick up on vinyl those things are gorgeous the sets they put together for those and it recreates that experience that i had as as a kid like opening say Marilyn Manson's Antichrist Superstar. Like the packaging on that shit was so elaborate. And um they're they're just really committed to that. And they 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 did that for many years through the help of uh uh Rob Sheridan, who was their art director for about 15 years. And Rob, I know Rob, he is like a meticulous and he's a meticulous artist, but he's also got that part of Reznor in him where he's always just pushing things to see what'll happen or what they'll do in terms of the photography he was doing for them or the stage shows he was designing for them. Um, not only is the, the, the music on the technology's bleeding edge, but also their distribution and also their just their entire look and vibe, you know, it's always been, it's just always been cool shit, you know? You know, and so, you know, moving into sort of, the the main topic about you know so Reznor and so I, I I did a little little bit of reading on, on Atticus Ross and sort of he sort mm -hmm. of starts working with Nine Inch Nails around uh, or starting with with teeth if, if I think that's correct yes um and so but then Ross and Reznor sort of team up and then they do the social network with David Fincher mm -hmm. and so I think it would be good just for our listeners sort of kind of run through like you know the the work that they've done. Um, cause they haven't worked. I mean, I think they're now best known for Fincher cause they've done, they've scored all of his movies since mm -hmm. social network. Yeah. Um, but they've also done other scores as well, but I want to talk, start off with, with social network and sort of, do you, do you know how that sort of came to be? Like how they sort of got together? Cause it's funny when you listen to like that score, you feel like it's such a perfect melding of director and composer to the point where it almost is like, why have they not been working together before Forever. this? Exactly. Yes. And Fincher's such a, you know, perfectionist. It's it's real, and so is Reznor. You know, they're they're you're right that they're perfectly matched for one another. My understanding is that um, after Fight Club, um, Fincher wanted to do a movie based on Chuck Palahniuk's Survivor, and that never got off the ground because of it, because that was right around 9-11 and the, the whole plot hinges on a plane crash or something and the studios didn't want to touch it. It was material that was also going to be like Fight Club where it was going to be, you know, challenging to audiences and very darkly funny and probably wouldn't have made a lot of money, if we're being honest. But um, I think that the plan was to have them do the score or have Trent Reznor slash Nine Inch Nails do the score for Survivor and then the whole thing fell apart. And then he looped back around to them on on social network. And that was just uh, as a as a, you know, a, basically a lifelong fan of that band. Uh, it was it was so cool to sit in a movie theater and watch a David Fincher movie with that that score later layered on top of it. And right the like right off the bat during the title sequence of that movie, you're getting that music. And it was just incredible. 
it just, you know, um, it was the last thing I expected them to do besides win an Oscar, I guess. But uh, I think the social network remains their best overall score work, you know? Mm. Uh, I think they've come close to it a few times, um, in particular with Mank. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was great. And then they did um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which, uh, great score. Uh, I wasn't so hot on that movie, though. Um, and then, uh, they, they have worked with directors other than Fincher. Like they did a Patriot day and, yeah, and, uh, and that's, you know, like when you get to like Patriot's day, like that to me is sort of like, that to me is where the mismatch comes in. Cause it's not like, you know, I can, I can, you know, you mentioned social network and I can hear that score in my head immediately. Right. But like, I had to be reminded like, Oh man, they did, they did Patriot's day. And that's such a weird, like social network and dragon tattoo seem like, like really good fits for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so does gone girl for that matter. Cause by that point you've established yes. a relationship with venture. Um, but Patriot's day is so weird because for lack of a better word, I find Peter Berg's recent filmography to be pretty jingoistic. Mm -hmm. um, oh yes. And it's, and it's weird for like, you know, it's like a resident like, yeah, I, I wrote capital G, but let's do, <laughs> right. <laughs> let's do Patriot's day. I think that, what you're seeing there and there's a, a mid nineties Jonah Hill's movie mm. is another one where if you hadn't told me it was Reznor or Ross doing some of the music in that, I probably wouldn't have known. Uh, Patriot's day. I, I, uh, that's, that's another one where I couldn't name a single track from it. I couldn't, you know, I think that with some film, some of the filmmakers they're working with, they're just not getting the direction that they're getting from, someone who's as meticulous and precise as, as David Fincher, wanting a certain tone and communicating that to them. You know, I almost get the impression on some of the non-Fincher work that, you know, they're, and particularly on mid nineties, like they, maybe they had some extra music sitting on a, on a <laughs> file somewhere. And it was like, well, this would probably work in there. And they were, Oh yeah, it's great. You know, and the director didn't go any further into guiding them around a moment or, you know, trying to trying to get the the vision of the movie to to collide with the music that was being made for it as as precisely as a, a Fincher production. Well, and I've seen behind the scenes footage on the social network and they're just like messing around. They're just like it's just like long. Yeah. Like, and yeah. I and if you listen to that commentary, I think or maybe it's in the making of documentary. But Fincher says they didn't say they didn't score a picture. They were just sending him sounds like they were making tracks. And so Fincher right. would then kind of work those and kind of meld it in and then they would work together to meld it in. So it would make sense that if they're working on like Bird Box or whatever and they're like, you know, here's some sounds. We're not necessarily scoring the picture here. We're not necessarily doing the rise and right. fall of the scenes that the director would be like, hey, yes, this fits here or there. I don't know. Right. I, I forgot agree. they did Bird Box. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, like a film like Bird Box, you kind of feel like like they established their their sound. Like, I mean, it was already obviously established with Nine Inch Nails, but like their sound for like film scores. And like that came at like Fincher, what they did with Fincher kind of establishes like this is what a Reznor Ross score sounds like. And then people are like, oh yeah, just give me something like that. But it's not as perfectly attuned right. to, to, to the material as it could be. So like Bird Box, it's like, this is kind of haunting and ominous, but not in a way that like really like sticks in your mind. Right. You could, if, I had never seen Bird Box. If you played that soundtrack for me and said, this is the score for a movie called Bird Box, what do you, what, what do you think? I would think, mm, some of this kind of sounds like someone trying to be Trent Reznor Atticus Ross. <laughs> you know, the, it's, it's just missing. The music is always quality. The work is always there. But, you know, there's, there's just a difference between them working with filmmakers that are not David Fincher and, and when they do. It's, you, you can hear it. On, on all of these well and even in gone girl like they have like they essentially make half of it as like a sarcastic score <laughs> like it's yeah it's sentimental and overly sappy until you get to the turn in the right. middle of the movie and then it's like oh this is the real score yeah because it's they're... it's doing that facade of the relationships that you're feeling yeah which i feel like only fincher the movie yeah yeah and i feel like only fincher could be like here's what i want i want you to make a sarcastic score for the first <laughs> half and then we'll get earnest you know we'll actually dig into the whatever for the second half it would not surprise me in the least if that were the case yeah. that it, like that exactly were the case you know it seems planned yeah i do feel like the one 
but I, I don't know if it's a filmmaker, but the one score of theirs that has come close to any other and what I would put up there with um, Social Network is Watchmen. Yeah. Same. I think the Watchmen score is stellar. The Watchmen score is incredible. Um, and and that's another one where I think that they were just very in tune with what the what the production was and what the what the product was, for lack of a better term. Um, the artistic vision of it all, I, I think they were very much on board with. They were creating music for that, again, without having seen final footage. And um, some of it really worked. I guess probably some of it didn't didn't get used. But what's there on screen is you wouldn't, the Watchmen series would not be as successful as it was, in my mind, without that score. It is just as important as the cast and the 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 art direction on that show and everything else. And that was another case where they just went hog wild on the physical releases of the soundtrack on vinyl. Each one was, you know, designed to be a different thing from a different period. And, you know, there were elaborate like sites that went along with it. And, um, it that felt like a, a five course meal, that one, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, the thing I really love about their Watchmen score is that it not only does it feel perfect like again like like their fincher stuff really well suited to the material but it's almost in a weird way like if if you were to get Reznor and ross to do a superhero score like this is kind of like it could only be this it could only be within the kind right. of realm that watchmen allows it to be rather than sort of like because you do have like those pulse pounding tracks like like in from the first none episode. with a motherfucking gun there you and, go you know, uh, <laughs> yeah and and so you have those but they're not like in the hands of sort of a different composer. They, those would be sort of more, I would guess more marvel is the best way I can put it. You know, there's a probably, kind of, you know, maybe something more along the lines of what Alan Silvestri does or, or maybe like um, Tyler Bates or something like sure. that. But, sure. you know, they sort of make it their own. And I think with Watchmen, you know, it really sort of, it, it like you said, it, it doesn't work as well without that score. Yeah. Um, and they've only only done other done. They've only done one other television. And that's Vietnam War, which I haven't heard. I haven't heard because I, I haven't. Good. I actually haven't heard that one. Either, <laughs> it's good. That uh, I just haven't gotten around to it. Very hard to watch. It, is it? Is the like, documentary on the Vietnam War hard to watch? Yeah. The Isn't score is very good. Is it funny? It's yeah. not very funny. No. What the fuck? <laughs> it's. Uh, I've always said the Vietnam War was the funniest of the week. <laughs> so, Take the opening here. of Spike Lee's Defy Bloods and make it a full docu series, and that's oh, that's the Vietnam Lord. War. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I just I think I just don't give a shit about. You know, obviously the Vietnam War is very historically important. Uh, in terms of seeing it, either in entertainment or. Um, you know, documentary style. I just don't really give a shit. Like I, I love the five bloods. That was great, but it's like, those are few and far between. That's like a genre of movie or uh documentary where it's, I can count on one hand, the, the films I like made around that, that uh central idea. I will say their Vietnam war score sounds familiar and it would, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but it does sound like it's something they have used before. Maybe there's like their motif throughout that series. But I could be entirely wrong. But I do well, remember I, I watched it a few years ago. It sounded very familiar. I still haven't gotten around to it, so I can't say for sure. But I will say that uh, there are running motifs and and melodies and um, all uh, that sort of thing running through all of Trent Reznor's work. You know, there's specific um, notes being struck on a piano over and over and over again. You know, it's there's there's a defining sound to them. And I guess, you know, when we talk about that defining town, I think that might be a good sort of transition point to Mank because, <laughs> yeah, the most serious, because like, I, I, you know, that the thing that sort of awes me about Mank is that it's very much in the mold of its time period. And yet it's like, yeah, I totally believe that this is a Reznor Roth score. Like at no point I was like, who are these guys? You know, it doesn't feel like them putting on airs or doing like 1940s music cosplay. It it still feels like them, but in a completely different mode. And so it's got, I kind of wanted to get your, your thoughts on the Mank score. Well, you and I had been talking about this on and off on on Twitter. I know, like, I would bring up the Mank score, and you'd be like, "Just fucking wait till you hear that soul <laughs> score, dude." And I'm like, "All right, all right," you know. But um, Mank, and I, I spent my morning sort of revisiting both of these scores before we recorded this. And um, my 
my thing with the Manx score is like if we're you know pitting these two together just for the sake of discussion sure. or against one another for the sake of discussion i i think that Manx is is a huge flex on their part you know you can you can point to all these other Reznor Ra scores that we talked about and see uh have a basic idea of what you're getting when you get a Reznor Ra score this to my ears, sounds nothing like them. Um, outside of the the quality of the music and the and the layers to it, um, it feels like them announcing, "Hey, we can do whatever the fuck we want." You know, check this out. This is music from the '30s and '40s, and we recorded it on these, you know, in this wildly elaborate way that it sounds authentic, even though it was, you know, recorded in multiple locations all over the world, and. Um, it's intoxicating that score. Uh, it's it's great, like just put it on in the background kind of music. Um, and with with uh, soul, I think I think soul is very interesting because to me it's the closest thing to um, their social network score. Uh, it's also um, <laughs> The stuff in in the soul soundtrack that actually sounds like Nine Inch Nails is few and far between. But when those moments hit, you you feel them. And so, like all my favorite songs off the off the soul soundtrack, all have that like twist of Nine Inch Nails flavor to them, where it's like just a little bit sinister. Not so much that you couldn't put it in a in a Pixar movie, but uh, those those moments are are in there. And it's uh, you know juxtaposed against John Baptiste's music he also contributed you know basically half the score to the movie um it's just a really interesting combination it would be hard for me to choose one over the other but i think in terms of which one is most technically uh, technically impressive and the one i will probably list end up listening to the most it's it's mank um and just for the for how unique it is and how unlike it is from anything else that they've done yeah, I guess my thing with Mank is like I and I'm not like trying to to rag on the Mank score when I was like, wait, do you hear soul? But like for me, like it's the sort of the somberness of soul. Like I was listening to it over the weekend, and I don't know. I'm very I like my music melancholy. And so just uh -huh. you know, and I think Mank has that. It definitely has that, but it has it in a certain different motif. Um, where I'm sort of aware, like it's it's the flex. Like I'm aware of like like what a flex it is. So mm -hmm. in some ways, like Mank is is taking me more listens to sort of be like, okay, I can sink into this and accept it what it is rather than like at first you have to sort of get past like the the craft of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. you, it, it, you can't escape it. Whereas Soul, like you said, because it's sort of in that vein of their previous work, I mm -hmm. think it sort of allowed me to sink into it more. Yeah, totally. I can see that. Um, Mank to me is is equivalent to Johnny Greenwood doing Phantom Thread, where it's just like, mm -hmm. holy shit. This is right. Really, right. Totally. There are so many different colors here where, you know, like Johnny Greenwood's There Will Be Blood score is so sinister and scary um, and puts me in a, like a really strange mood anytime I listen to it. And you're like, oh, so this is Johnny Greenwood. And that's kind of how you felt about Reznor and Ross. Where you're like, all right, it's kind of their music, like their film score is kind of icy, kind of cool, uh, you know, a little sinister. Um, but Mank, like right off the bat, I was like, whoa, this is really beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the, <laughs> and the really other cool. thing, truthfully, about the Mank score is it's overwhelming. Yeah. There's just so goddamn much of it, you know. They released the the 90 minute album, but then at the same time, you could get two hours of additional bonus music. And I remember like that day, just listening to the whole thing. It, it fucking took most of an afternoon, you know. <laughs> um, and it was hard for me at a certain point to sort of um, not differentiate tracks because that sort of implies that they all sounded the same, and I don't believe that. But when the body of work is, you know, 60 tracks long or 87 tracks or whatever the fuck it was, it's it's hard to start organizing it in your mind versus an album that's got maybe 14 tracks on it. And you can be like, OK, these are the three real bangers and these are the singles and, and so on and so forth. These are the last SNL sketches of the night songs, you know, where they're just really swinging for the fences. Now, Mank is like. Mank is like reading a novel as as an album whereas soul i think is more like you know a uh, uh okay well, i was gonna say short story but that's not right 
Mank is more of an EP where Soul is an LP, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, Mank sort of, it's 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 kind of, it's symphonic. You know, it has movements, basically, sure. at that point. Because, like, when it all bleeds together like that, you're kind of experiencing it as the work rather than like, oh, this was the track when the character did X, Y, and Z. Like, I couldn't, I really couldn't pinpoint that in Mank. Like, I couldn't, it because Mank right. is the score almost existing as itself. Whereas, like, you know, I can instantly hear on story, like, oh, that's when Joe falls into the spirit world. You know? Right, sure, sure. See, in Mank, I can hear when the gambling thing happens, because that, like, just puts a pit in my stomach, because that whole scene, I'm just like, no, Mank. <laughs> so, like, when <laughs> that part it, of the man. score happens, it gets, because I do think the Mank score is is pretty melancholic as it as mm. it gets through. You know, it begins pretty bombastic and overwhelming, and it's beautiful and classical, and then as you start to get it, dig into the story, it, it, it starts to reflect more the sadness of that character. Um... But Soul, I think, you know, I, I think I was expecting I was expecting it to sound not that it doesn't sound dissimilar from the social network, but I was expecting it to sound more like the social network. And it's kind of like, how do you score the afterlife? Like, how do you even begin to do that? And they they issue like something like ethereal and go for something like a little playful almost and a little mm -hmm. like curious, like the soul score feels like it's playing around. Um, I think it's beautiful and I think it's really surprising. Um, I don't know, I, but I also think there's something a little unfinished about it, which is not a negative. Like, it just kind of reflects the afterlife. It feels like you're just getting mm -hmm. one toe into this larger world. Yeah, there is that sense of, with most of the soul score, of like just sort of dipping your toe into this yeah. other world. So I know, I know what you mean by that. And with the social network comparisons, it takes three or four tracks on the soul soundtrack until it really starts bleeding into that propulsive nature of the um the social network score but once it's there you can absolutely hear it and then it's like another five or six tracks till they get to uh uh let me see i guess it's i guess it's um terry time uh and then there's another track terry time too but both of them have uh that it's like 5% of the sinister sound of Nine Inch Nails. Mm -hmm. um, those are the ones I have uh, starred here. Uh, along with Pursuit, Ship Chase, Escape. Um, Return to Earth is really interesting because it sounds almost like, it almost sounds like Hurt being played on a child's piano or like a, a toy piano or something you know so there there's this sense with the score uh, the the soul score for me that is and i don't mean this in a derogatory way um but almost like resident ross for kids you know i mean that's exactly what it is but yeah. it's also it's also not threatening in any way you know there are there are darker moments in it to be sure but it's um it's like it, it's it's the Reznor Ross score you could put on like at a, a kid's birthday party or something, you know, it's kind of a it, it, that, you know, it's a flex. The Manx score is a flex in its own way, but the soul score is also a flex in its own way. It's incredible that the guy who sang like God is dead and no one cares and fucking closer and a million other songs you know, is doing a score for a Disney movie now. And yeah, I never wanted to say this on Twitter for fear of like you know, launching some sort of James Gunn style fucking, you know, firing against <laughs> Trent Reznor or Atticus Ross. But it it's truly amazing to me that somebody didn't take up that cause and and try to complain about these guys working on a, a Disney movie. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's weird. It's I sort of like, I guess. In a weird way, we like people have just sort of accepted, you know, like that the sort of that the the past art is always falls in the realm of the acceptable. So in, in the sense that like, you know, Jamie Foxx used to do in living color and I'm sure that there are sketches from in living color that people are like, Oh, they shouldn't do that because there was, you know, comedy in the early nineties, but right. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter now because it's not to say that like, you know, Reznor and Ross are establishment now. It's not to say that, but I think that they have, I'll, I'll put it this way. I don't think they would have gotten a Pixar movie had they not, done a solid decade of work you sure. know, before that 
Um, so I don't think Pixar was really taking a chance on them. And yet I think that they were still rewarded because that soul score does not feel like a phoned in score. Like it does with, you know, mid nineties where mm -hmm. it's just sort of anonymous. I think they still got the goods there. Um, even if, you know, it's like, it is kind of crazy when you look at the band's history and like the things that they used to say. Um, but again, I think that's one of the more remarkable things about Nine Inch Nails is that they have been around for so long and yet it doesn't feel like they've sold out or they're doing sort of like, you know, the oldies tour, you know, that they're no, still pushing um, that envelope. Trent Reznor is, is something of an elder statesman now, you know, he's mm -hmm. sort of like what, you know, what Stephen King ultimately became or, you know, somebody like, uh, Dr. Dre, who's, you know, surely problematic in his own ways, but you know, these are guys that are making big business moves. Jay-Z might be another example. Mm -hmm. These guys that were always, uh, you know, culturally relevant or, and, and sometimes forcing themselves to be culturally relevant, despite all the time that they had been around. Um, but in their, in their later years, sort of becoming untouchable in that way. You know, I remember, I, I remember a long period, probably in the early 2000s or so, where, you know, like, I remember uh, dating a couple different girls who thought it was hilarious that I was into Nine Inch Nails. That was like, not a cool thing to be into. I was like, fuck you, Nine Inch Nails rules <laughs> every time, you know, and um, they, they went through a little period of that, I think, where it was like, uh, we get it, Trent Reznor, you're angry and sad. But his the, their music has changed. Um, uh, I, I think after Trent got clean and after he started having kids, and uh, you can still find that anger in there. That that trio of LPs that they released a couple of years ago, like Bad Witch and Add Violence, uh, those albums. Man, you you want angry Trent? He's back on those, you know. Um, he hasn't lost it, but I do think the the music has changed uh, a bit. It's it's it, certainly lyrically, it's less um, selfish or self centered, you know. And it's you know he's always been lashing out at something or lashing at himself, um, and he's moved away from lashing away at himself so much anymore. I think and. I don't know if the music the music benefits from that or or not. That's for each listener to decide. But I think it's a fascinating uh, sort of process and, and progress to to watch play out as a as a fan of the group. And their their scores are changing as well. Um, I don't know what you know. I don't know what they're working on right now, actually, but. You know, after after Mank and after Soul, it's sort of like, and and certainly Watchmen. It's like, man, these guys can do fucking anything. Yeah. You know, I'd like to see them paired with someone that you would never imagine, um, and just see what the results are. Like a hardcore visionary filmmaker, not like, you know, Jonah Hill, uh, for instance. Uh, you bought well, a black they... turtleneck, but you still only directed one movie, buddy. Come on. <laughs> you know. Um, what. Well, I think they've also been able to able to avoid self parody in a way that someone like Marilyn Manson like hasn't. Like I remember when Manson was yeah. on like the Matrix Revolution soundtrack, uh, and he was just everywhere. Nine Inch Nails just kind of remained cool, and Trent and there was always this degree of authenticity to Trent that kind of like stayed that entire time to the point that you're watching Twin Peaks: The Return, and it's like, ladies and gentlemen, Nine Inch Nails, and you're like, what? just show up <laughs> in the middle of Twin Peaks and just perform there. And it that doesn't was... feel it doesn't feel like they're bloviating or they're like flexing or anything. It just feels like, well, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, this is I would. Cool. I, I want to ask him so much about. I want to know if he knew or if the band knew what episode they were going to be in. Yeah. <laughs> when they filmed that performance in the in the roadhouse. Like that's one of the greatest hours of television ever produced. Yes. Absolutely. You know, full stop. Uh, so I wonder and I remember if, like collective episode, like I remember everyone watching it live and afterwards just being like, I need to talk about this with someone. <laughs> I fuck I the night that aired, I was I I had an old podcast called Trying Times that no one listened to, but we did it just for fun. And I was recording that night, I remember, and um, uh, at a certain point in the recording, my phone just started blowing up, 
Like I knew Twin Peaks was airing, but I was also like, I'll catch it after I'm done recording, you know? Yeah. And uh, my phone was just going nuts. And it, it was going off to a degree that I thought someone had died. So I'm like, and, but I, so I glanced at the messages and it was just like, you know, uh, they made this episode of Twin Peaks just for Scott Wampler. And like, <laughs> and I remember Phil Nobile Jr. specifically texting me, you know, going nuclear on the option. <laughs> to be like, do not get online right now. Just watch the new episode of Twin Peaks. And I was like, that can only mean one thing. This must be the Nine Inch Nails episode, you know, yeah. and it, man, to, to have that performance in that episode was, it was like a gift. I'll, I'll never forget watching that. I stood up off the fucking couch. I was so excited, <laughs> you know? That was great. But yeah, I think, you know, they can do anything and people will be like, yeah. So like when it was announced they were doing a Pixar movie, it wasn't like, whoa, this is kind of strange. Or like, that's an odd fit. You're like, hey, you know what? Like Peak Doctor is one of the more imaginable filmmakers over there. This is a mm -hmm. movie about the afterlife. Like, I trust that this will be cool. I think there was an interview. I forget what they were promoting at the time, but um, Reznor and Ross appeared at some. It was like, you know, one of those live streamed variety things or something where they were talking about the latest the latest score that they had worked on and asked them like, well, for instance, would you work on a, a Pixar movie? And Trent was just like, we wouldn't say no. To, well, we'd have to hear what it is. But yeah, we could do that. You know, and I wonder if Pete Doctor or someone at Pixar saw that. And then when Soul came around was like, hey, maybe this would be a good fit for yeah. these guys. It's another question I'd like to ask that guy. Huh. So who are some filmmakers y'all might want to see them work with? I got to say, after seeing Lynn Ramsey team up with with uh, Johnny Greenwood on, um, oh, yeah. you know, you're never really here. I would love to see her team up with Reznor and Ross. That would be great. I was going to say, even though I didn't love Destroyer, Karen Kusama, I think. Oh, I that's another good one. Yeah. Uh, I want to see him work with the Safdie brothers. Yeah. I think that would be, <laughs> that, that'd be too that, much. I couldn't I, take it. I well, I, eyeballs I, start bleeding, ears start bleeding. <laughs> I think I kind of uh, offended them once because I hosted a, a screening of Uncut Gems before it came out. Uh, with them as the guests uh, here in Austin. And um, I had a few beers during that movie. So I might have rethought the, the wording of the, the way I put this in the Q&A afterwards. But if it had I been sober, but I was just like, well, the, the score, 10 Tricks Point never did the, the score for um, Uncut Gems. And it's, it's excellent. I have no complaints about it. And I brought that up and was like, you all know who sh you should work with is uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. They were like, well, we love what 10 Tricks point whenever. I was like, yeah, but you should really work with it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and retro, in retrospect, I think they were kind of like, what the fuck? You know, like I was, but I wasn't trying to be, you know, disrespectful to uh, uh, Daniel. How do you say his last name? Louboutin? I'm not, I'm not good with names. And I've never the composer met composer so. of uncut gems. No, the no composer of uncut gems. Yes. Uh, I can say his complicated stage name, but I can't say his actual name apparently. Um, yeah, those, and I'd, I'd like to see them work with somebody, uh, really like a chili director, like, um, Christopher Nolan, actually. <laughs> like, I'd like to see what sort of life they could inject into, yeah. uh, a Christopher Nolan movie. I mean, I definitely think Nolan benefited from changing it up and not working with Hans Zimmer again and like working with Ludwig Gordonson on Tenet. And I think that that score tamp came out really great. Yeah, it's good. I, I, um, I didn't like Tenet and oh, uh, I don't like the movie, but the score I think is, is one of the, is, is at least solid. Well, if I liked it, I might be more inclined to savor the details of the score, Fair. but it, it, that was the sort of thing where it only occurred to me once or twice while watching it. Like, yeah, the score's pretty good, you know? Unlike, say, Inception, where it was just a constant presence and I felt more like, you know, um, I don't know. I felt more engaged by the by that score, which is not to say anything negative about the, the Tenet score. Please, Nolan fans, do not come out. Say, we, we've talked so much shit about <laughs> Nolan on this yeah. Those guys, man, I've they called are him passionate. a prissy weirdo more than once. <laughs> <laughs> They uh they get really mad. If you ever want to get anyone really mad on Twitter, just go on there and just type 
Christopher Nolan is a virgin. Send. <laughs> and you will have a war going on in your mentions within 30 seconds. I will they say Edgar Wright is another like really meticulous filmmaker and also like a music fiend. I would be curious to see what kind of score they would put together for an Edgar Wright film. Edgar Wright seems so, um, you know, he his films, I think, rely on songs more than score. Yeah. And so I don't I don't know if that would be a good fit. I'd be curious to see what what that resulted with. But I'd also be kind of curious to see what would happen if you if you paired these guys with anybody. Um, Fuck it. Spielberg. God, just you just destroy their romanticism. <laughs> He's fucking get the them in there for War of the by. Worlds. Like, <laughs> that would have been amazing, you know? Um, Spielberg almost worked with them on a movie, actually. There's, um, oh, really? Yeah, there's a, a scene, the flesh fair scene in AI, and there's a, a, a band up on stage, and they ultimately went with, um, who the fuck was that? God damn it. The, the name of the... The the band is escaping me right now. You would know the name if I told you. Uh, people are going to remind me later. I'm going to feel stupid. But um, my understanding is that they were approached about doing it and just passed on the whole thing, which is pretty, pretty wild, um, mm -hmm. if true. Uh, but God ministry, ministry, that's, that's who it fucking was. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> man, can you imagine? Nine Inch Nails up on the stage at the Flesh Fruit scene. <laughs> and you can kind of see like what Spielberg would have been going for in yeah. in that moment. But honestly, I think Ministry is a great choice in that in that sequence. You know, their their performance in that film is so like just uh you can't understand a word the fucking guy is saying. You know, it's just noise, basically. You know, and chaos going on 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 stage while everything else is 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 happening. So I can sort of see what Spielberg was going for there. Um, but also, it's just kind of interesting to realize that Steven Spielberg is aware of Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> like I can't believe I can't imagine him, you know, listening to the Downward Spiral and being like, "Oh, we got to get this in the next one." <laughs> um. All right. Well, I think that's a that's a good part. To, I, I don't know how you can top the Spielberg listening to Nine Inch Nails. So let's <laughs> the image of that in your head. So we're going to move on uh, to, to recently watched. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, what have you seen lately that you want to talk about? Well, um, yesterday, uh, my wife and I marathoned the entirety of uh, season three of Cobra Kai, which was uh, good. Um, I, I just want to say about this show, I have another recommendation I want to make, but about that show, I do think it's pretty miraculous what they pulled off there. Um, that show, like when I first heard the idea for Cobra Kai, I was like, are you fucking kidding me with this? <laughs> like, there's no way this is going to work. And, and it absolutely does. And uh, I get a feeling watching Cobra Kai that is, is very unique to, to me and my viewing habits in that um, I'm just so happy for everyone involved with that production. You know, not only that it works, but that, you know, William Zabka and Ralph Macchio are out here playing these characters again, and they're they're kind of killing it, you know, and that it's um, unapologetically uh, sort of ridiculous. You know, it takes place in a reality where all problems are solved by doing karate at each other. And, you know, there's like a town that's overrun with these fucking karate dojos. It's so like antiquated and ridiculous that this would be the case. Um I, I just love that about it. But the thing I really want to recommend to people is spontaneous. Um, that is uh, one of my favorite movies from last year. I've watched it a few times now. Um, it's funny as shit. It's it's very dark. <clears throat> and it it's also uh, very honest, I think. Um, Brian Duffield directed that. He's He's been a working screenwriter for for some years. He's had his own issues with Hollywood, I gather, with uh, Jane Got a Gun and, uh, you know, that unfortunate situation. But um, he just knocked that fucking movie out of the park. And it's maybe the only movie I saw streaming this past year where I felt like, oh, this would have probably been a, a hit if like a sleeper hit if you had put it in theaters. You know, that that movie is just excellent from top to bottom. 
Yeah, that's one I've been meaning to check out. I've heard nothing but good things about. You haven't seen? Oh, I haven't seen it yet. No. Oh man, it's so good. It's so good. I haven't seen it, but my recently watched is another Brian Duffield film, which is Love and Monsters, which he wrote on spec. It was called Monster Problems. Um, And I think he was rewritten or something. The co-writer is Matthew Robinson, directed by Michael Matthews. It's the Dylan O'Brien apocalyptic dog movie. Um, And it's a good dog movie. Uh, I checked it out on VOD. It it takes place in a like it's like seven years after some sort of apocalypse. Essentially, what happened was there was a meteor coming to Earth. We launched nukes at it. Hooray, we stopped the meteor, but all of the nukes ruined the environment and turned all of the animals into like mutant animals and turned them into <laughs> monsters. So what? the surface is inhabited by these monsters and people live in colonies underground. Dylan O'Brien reconnects with his high school sweetheart and she's like 80 miles away. So he decides to go to the surface and try and get there. Uh, meets a dog along the way. The dog is great. I don't know what it says about me, but I cared more about the well-being for this dog than I have with like any human in any film I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm uh, always like that with the dog. Yeah, and it was getting very like genuinely like I might have to turn this off like when things were getting rough for the dog. Um, but I will spoiler alert tell you the dog is okay. The dog doesn't die. I think that's no, I go, there's a website that's like does the dog live, and I check that website whenever I see it. Like I see <laughs> a dog Christ, in a movie, I'm like I need to know shit. if this dog makes it. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the dog worst. is super cute. Yeah, when a, when a movie is just like cruel to a dog like i i won't see it i didn't see the first john wick for like two years after it came out because i knew they like stomped the dog dog to death in it and i was like i don't i don't know this seems like a bit much i don't i don't think i'm gonna like that and that followed like a year at fantastic fest where every other movie had a dog being brutally murdered on screen and i'm like (laughs) you know i just don't need this in my life um but i didn't that's out now I didn't yeah, know, so it's I, on, I don't know anything about that. It's on VOD now. It's supposed to be a Paramount movie that hit theaters last year and it didn't. Um, and Dylan O'Brien's character is like he has like a freezing problem. He's like a coward. Like everyone else in his colony can fight and he doesn't fight. So that makes like he's going on this trek by himself on the surface and encountering all these monsters and everything. Uh, it kind of has like a bit of like a John Hughes esque like notion to it. Like there's narration from him. He's super charismatic. I think O'Brien does a great job. Jessica Henwick plays um, the girl he's going after. Um, but it's a really nice kind of like, uh, like travelogue, like it's it wisely, like if you look at the premise or even watch a trailer, you may think like, oh, this is another one of those like post-apocalyptic movies, but it has a really great voice. I would be curious to know like how much of it is Duffield's. Cause I have also heard great things about spontaneous, which I haven't seen yet. Um, and yeah, you're kind of just describing spontaneous here a little bit. It's got a, <laughs> a very fun. strong John Hughes feel. To yeah. It. And it was he, shot by Lachlan Milne, who was the DP on Minari, um, which no is, shit. looks fantastic. So I can't believe I follow Brian on Twitter and I, I I'm completely unaware of this movie. I don't like he doesn't tweet a lot about movies on which he has been rewritten. So I, that's why I wonder if he was rewritten. Oh, on this and did, that's probably yeah. and how much of it is him versus how much of it is whatever. But I liked it. I, I had a really good time with it. Um, he still hasn't would, seen Underwater. A movie he wrote and that I really like. And I've talked to him about this, like, fucking underwater rules, dude. And he's like, still not seeing it. Nope. (laughs) Like, he's just, he seems completely disinterested in seeing underwater. But that was another one of my favorite movies from last year. Totally unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. It looked like Leviathan or Deep Star Six. Like, it, like they advertised it like it was some sort of, you know. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of alien DNA in that movie, but uh, I love the production design on it. And also, I saw that one in theaters, and it was admittedly kind of muddy on screen, you know, like hard to discern a lot of the detail in it. But on uh, my wife and I picked it up on on one of us bought it for the other one for for Christmas, and um, like at home, that thing looks gorgeous, like those those Moebius designed uh, like diving suits and all that shit it's got the best thing about it is the ending and you i don't want to spoil that for anybody but um it's uh yeah fucking underwater rules i I guess i'll uh i'll keep talking about monsters Uh, i recently watched uh shin godzilla which Mm. i've never seen is that the one that's like mostly in a boardroom yeah it's mostly boardrooms (laughs) so it's it's a toho godzilla film but it's the first of the toho godzilla films to basically be a remake to be like a total reboot in the sense that like it does not acknowledge that Godzilla has existed before. Hmm. And so what's really 
like it kind of starts out kind of satirical where it's like Godzilla is coming and like it's all about the government response and like it's like the real monster is bureaucracy and so you have all these people like like who like we have to talk to this department head and this department head and then this one and like and it's like Godzilla is coming you guys probably it's not nimble enough to handle Godzilla and so sort of in the the next two thirds of the film, this kind of splinter group of like volunteers is like, we're just going to like be our own task force. And it becomes kind of like a weird political drama that happens to have Godzilla in it. And it works <laughs> like it works really well, especially because, um, and not to spoil anything, but like there becomes like the question of like, how do we deal with Godzilla? Do we do the nuclear option? And to me, like that is a, a, that's the kind of callback you have to make to the 1954 mm -hmm. Godzilla. Cause that is of course is all, is all rooted in the atomic age. Um, and especially Japan, the only nation to ever, you know, suffer under a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Godzilla is so part of that, that cult, that sort of, you know, their identity in a post-war world. And I think for Shin Godzilla to kind of go back to that and be like, what do we do now? Um, you know, especially as we face new problems, like, you know, is, is the government as structured fast enough to deal with these rampaging problems, but it's also just a super entertaining Godzilla film. So I was, I was, I bought it, the Blu-ray like sight unseen because I'd heard so many good things about it. And I was, I was very pleased with the Shin Godzilla. My old, uh, uh, co-editor, uh, Evan Sadoff at, at Birth Movies Death was, he's the biggest Godzilla nerd that I know, loves Godzilla. And, uh, I remember him talking about that one when it came out and, uh, almost getting me to watch it. Uh, but <laughs> my thing with the Godzilla movies is that I always love them more in theory than I do in practice. Sure. You know, I love that Godzilla is a franchise. Like I will cheer that thing on until I'm dead. But 90% of the time when I sit down to watch a Godzilla movie, I kind of like after half an hour, I'm like, okay, I get it. Yeah. Here's, you know? here's, the, thi yeah, here's the thing about Godzilla films. Like uh, I'm not going to be out here being like every Godzilla movie is amazing. A lot of them are just sort of like, you're kind of waiting to get to the monster because the, yeah. the, like the human characters suck. And like, that's sort of the big hurdle that they have to clear. And uh, Shin Godzilla works because like the person now, like it just moves because it's like a, it's treating itself like a government drama, like, and sort of like, it's all about like, it's almost it, it, it's a bit of a stretch to say like if Aaron Sorkin made a Godzilla, it would look kind of like Shin Godzilla, but it it moves and has a pacing that I find that like weaker Godzilla films like lack. Like, you know, Godzilla versus Mothra is all well and good, but I also accept that it has a lot of slow parts and it's mm -hmm. only at its best when it's being super weird. Um, so Shin Godzilla, I would say like, if, if you, if you're someone who, who doesn't really like Godzilla films, I would still say Shin Godzilla is worth a shot because it is not your typical Godzilla movie. Mm. I'm definitely going to get around to it at some point. Sure. It's the <laughs> only Godzilla movie right currently that I'm going to get around to at some point. That's the, the best I can say about Fair it enough. at this point. Fair yeah. enough. All right. Well, Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure talking with you. Mm -hmm. um if people want to keep up with you and keep up with the king cast where can we find find y'all on twitter uh you're gonna want to go to at king cast 19 uh we drop new ev episodes every wednesday um uh if you've not heard the show our our whole uh bit here is that uh we are a show that takes a look at Stephen King adaptations, both the text and the movie that was adapted from that text, whether it be a TV show or miniseries. And um, the hook of the show is that our guests uh, get to pick whichever adaptation they want to talk about. So um, typically speaking, uh, you're going to get episodes that have uh, people who, who you know and love from other things uh, just geeking the fuck out about Stephen King, sh Stephen King stuff. They either really like or really don't like. Um, every episode is a little bit different depending on the guest and and what the uh, subject matter is. Um, but if you're at all a Stephen King fan, I would definitely recommend checking in with us. Yes, please listen to that show. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to keep up with the Collider podcast, you should follow us on Twitter. Uh, Adam, where can we find you on Twitter? At Adam Chipman. And you can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back with you next week.